this one. Shall I make the political speech with this one? Genius. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, as you see, my, my sentence is not why open source hardware isn't, work, isn't happening or working, it's, it's more whether is or isn't working. And um, I was asked to make a very like open talk, so I will not make any product placement in my talk. I'm sorry if you came here for that. You can't see that at other places. Uh, I have made very black and white slides, and I will use no video, which is completely against my principles. Uh, but the idea is to open up a discussion so that we can have a more critical conversation about things that work and don't work. Just briefly about me, I'm one of the founders of the Genuino project, also known as Arduino project in the United States. Uh, the reason why it's called differently is because of a legal matter that I can't discuss here, so I'm sorry. If you make, ask me a question about that, I will not be allowed to answer. I'm also a researcher and a professor, uh, adjunct is the right word, at Malmo University in Sweden for the last 16 years. And I'm a researcher at the Internet of Things and People Research Group, as well as the head of the Institute of Interactive Objects, which is a facility at Malmo University's uh, design and art school. <clears throat> Also, full disclosure, the website for the event is wrong. I, <laughs> I didn't create or help create in the Fab Lab at Stapabet Sparken, which is a cultural center in Sweden. I'm not the director of the Fab Lab. Um, that's it. And now let's go talking. So I guess I'm invited here because I'm one of the founders of the Arduino slash Genuino project. I'm the guy that designed the boards. Uh, help out with the firmware, uh, you know. We were all doing everything in the first days is how it works when you start something like this. And uh, I'm gonna be talking from that perspective. Anyway, everything that I will say, it's my personal opinion, you know. So I'm not representing Arduino or, or Malmo University during this talk, but again, since I'm a human being and I'm in a legal case, if there's a question I can answer, I will not answer it but I will be very polite. Uh, also, I'm gonna mention people that are real in my presentation, and I don't mention these people to be criticizing their position. I think all positions are perfectly valid, so I just want you to get an overview of things that are happening in the world and how things have been developing. And also, I might not have 100% of the information right, so when we start the discussion, you're welcome to tell me whatever. So I think one of the biggest issues when we talk about open source hardware is trying to understand the distinction between companies and projects. Because companies are not the same thing as projects. And people don't really understand what this means. So what are companies? Companies are for-profit entities that they might or might not have a corporate social responsibility department. Uh, there's different models for this kind of department. You can see what MySQL did, like separated the open source part from the business part and handle both things in that way. So you could say that the open source part of MySQL was the corporate social responsibility part of MySQL once it got incorporated. Red Hat, which is the company behind Linux Torvalds, you know, has a company that's dedicated to business but contributes to, to Linux. Another company that's the biggest contributor to Linux nowadays is Intel. People don't know this, but at the same time, they have a very clear corporate social responsibility, uh, uh, responsibility by having a lead, the Intel Foundation that does a lot of activities within education, et cetera, et cetera. So there is different strategies how companies can approach this matter. And in open source hardware, we're gonna see how this also happens. But companies employ people to create products, services, and processes for other people. And that's very important. So there's a bunch of employees, and all the IP produced belongs to an entity that is abstract that has a bunch of owners or a board that controls it or whatever. What happens with projects? Well, according to people's perception, projects are for non-profit entities. And in the art world, this is a very powerful message. Hey, we, did, we do this for the greater good, you know. Um, it typically involves into having a social agenda. Like, we do this project and we do it because we want to help somebody. In my opinion, in open source, especially open source software, and therefore also probably open source hardware, people do something because they need it for themselves. And then they can, by induction, get this thing, get this thing to work for somebody else. And that's very interesting. At some point, if projects grow big enough, they need a governance model. 
and they, they need a sustainable operative model. In other words, let's say you make a project in the open source hardware field, you design some boards, you have this mission of reaching, of reaching as many kids as possible, and if suddenly you start to get millions of orders, then you need to create a proper entity that will be able of you know, delivering. Because people have expectations, and for a project to survive, you need to fulfill at least those expectations to some degree. <clears throat> Projects typically start working with volunteers, and they create products, services, and processes, first for themselves, and second for other people. You see, I'm not saying anything about the IP, because the, the IP is protected in the exact same way in companies and projects. I mean, I don't see a reason why there couldn't be a project that has patents, for example, and you know, let people explore the patents for free. I see no difference from a legal standpoint between that and having a completely open source uh, project. <clears throat> Some years ago, I wrote a paper about open source hardware, uh, the summit that, that took place at IBM. And I don't know if people have realized in the open source community how very important that one summit was. That one summit, what happened is that uh, MakerBot came on stage and announced they were going closed source. I mean, how paradoxical it is that an open source hardware summit, a company that was a paradigm for open source hardware design, came on stage to say, hey guys, we're closing down. In that very same uh, summit, uh, the founders of uh, 3D Robotics, which is a drone company in the States, they also came on stage to say, oh, they didn't really think that open source hardware business models could work and they were going to go close. Funny enough, the person that said that was the editor of Wire Magazine that was interviewing the director of MakerBot that was on the cover of Wire Magazine that month. So it was like a funny, funny situation. Um, and just to make things even more creepy, uh, I didn't have an, a ticket to the Open Source Hardware Summit. I couldn't, I didn't find the time to buy it. And I got a ticket from MakerBot's uh, director, Brett himself. Uh, so I wrote a paper to explain this whole thing as a love story. And I, I will tell you why it's important, this particular paper in this talk, and it is because in that paper I'm portraying the history of open source hardware as yet another part of the, yet another normal business model that is cyclic. When it's not making any money, nobody cares about it, literally. You know, yeah, it has some supporters, people boost your ego, you work in it, you know, as long as you have some extra time and you do something with it, when it starts to become more and more interesting, it creates a lot of traction, money attracts money, investors start to, start to offer you and tempt you, and you start to get the money because you want to grow and you want to scale up and you want to produce more, and so on and so forth. And then, all of a sudden, an investor comes and says, why should you have this thing open? Your competitive advantage is to have it closed. And then you go close, and then it's gone. And this is what happened, for example, with MakerBot, and that's why I mentioned it. And again, I have nothing against what happened. I'm perfectly fine with it. I, I sleep at nights perfectly fine, you know. Uh, and what I saw, and this is why I wrote this paper, is that this was a repetition. This had happened with the history of personal computers. In the beginning, with personal computing, people were meeting up in a situation like this, and they were saying, hey guys, I put together this keyboard with these processors that I made this thing, and I managed to get 320 pixels wide. And somebody came in and said, oh, you know what? I managed to get the same as you, but with sound. And it was a very open discussion when there was a certain degree of competition. People were showing to the others what they were doing. People were improving on one another and so on. Until somebody started to sell computers, Apple in this case, and decided to go closed source with the things they had learned from others. So there is no difference. And that they made millions, and the rest is history. So one of the aspects that really bothers everybody in this scenario is scaling. And they look at scaling from just one single point of view. And I'm going to give you three different perspectives on scaling. Scale, uh, per perspective number one is asked in part size. So many people ask me many times, why did Arduino succeed? The truth of the matter is that there's no single answer to that. But the first answer is that there was nothing like it, you know, literally. And one of the reasons why there was nothing like it is because you could make it yourself without having to use absolutely no industrial processes. You could go to a store, buy a breadboard, buy a chip, put everything together on this breadboard with some cables, and you could start building your own mini computer just there. Because it was through whole technology, anybody could do it, even children that they could, you know, no children under three years old allowed, but 
That's what usually says on the packages. But because of this through-hole technology, it was possible for anybody to do it. So the scale of the components was part of the success. The second reasoning around scale is the scale in code needs. And I'm going to quote uh, Bunny Huang, uh, which is the creator of the Chambi, among other interesting open source projects. But Chambi is not open source, but he made all other open source projects. And in his vision, Moore's Law doesn't really need to be challenged anymore. And I think this is something that people tend to forget. So in the engineering world, and I'm an, I am a microelectronics engineer, we totally love the idea that everybody comes and says, oh, we have double the transistors than last year. Now we have three di dimensional transistor layering in microchips, you know, and the year after. Now we're talking about quantum computing and so on and so forth. Okay, that's fantastic. But from the user's perspective, we've reached this point where there is processors that contain everything we need to perform very complex tasks. You know, we, uh, my personal opinion, I don't think we need much more complex processors. We can just reiterate the science by adding stuff inside a piece of silicon and just get something that will do exactly what we need for a lot of different things. And that's kind of like what one in one is saying. He's saying that uh, since we don't need any more computation needs, we don't need to continue improving more slow, we can focus on optimizing costs. So we can scale up because we can put more stuff in less space. That's pretty cool. This brings the next, the next idea of scaling, which is sell as much as you can, which is scaling as in scaling growth. And this actually right now in the current situation in history is empowered by the idea of IoT. If you have been making any kind of research in IoT like I've been doing in the last three years, you will see that every company CEO comes out with a larger amount of connected devices. Like Ericsson CEO said at some point, 50 billion connected devices. The one from Cisco got very hot and said 220. And somebody else came in and said, and then somebody made a graph and said, no, it's actually looking at a time scale, time scale. Like 2020 will be just cars and 2030 will be homes. And, and I don't care. The thing is that it's very easy to talk about growth when it's about the future and you don't know what's going to happen. You wish that would happen, but you don't know whether it will happen or not. So in order to reach this whole idea of IoT, the prices have to go down. Be cheaper means optimizing. So we get the optimization idea twice. Mm -hmm. And it can be done at many levels. It can be done at a technical level, you know, making better processes to produce chips, and so on and so forth. And ca it can be done from an organizational level. Like if I have a chip company, for example, and I make microchips, I could go fire some people because they are inefficient and I can just focus, you know, at producing a single line of microchips that are more focused in my market. Until a couple of years ago, most of the silicon vendors were doing everything. Now we are seeing how they're specializing. For example, Intel announced recently they were giving away their mobile market, which is, I think, very intelligent because they're competing against another brand, which is ARM, that is having pretty good uh, outreach there, you know. At the same time, uh, analog, for example, gave away microcontrollers <laughs> because they were focusing more on sensors. And so on and so forth. I could go on like this. But if you've been following the press over the last couple of years, you will realize that this, this is what's happening. So this whole problem with scale brings up this bubble because everybody started to talk about scale and people started to build up on the others one scale. And it became, in my opinion, a very interesting cockfight. And you can quote me on this. Uh, because it was also about a lot of males sitting in different corporate rooms discussing about how much money they could make. Forgetting about the users and forgetting about that they had to embed these electronics in people's everyday uh, course and try to see whether they made sense or not. So the problem right now is that we have a lot of companies trying to operate in the very same space, which is your home or your kid's education or your car or whatever. The problem is that the market size is limited. And all of them think they're going to sell to the whole market. So all of them try to operate on the same size of the same market. So their investments get directed to put the efforts in the same, same place. Uh, so to summarize this concept, you have to keep in mind for the rest of the discussion that price matters, scale matters, and integration matters. Integration from the idea of how much you can push in a single silicon. So let's talk about a couple of examples. 
So the first story, uh, I will have to, of course, talk about Arduino in the US and Genuino in Europe. And this was born as a, pro as a project of a platform. So we were a couple of guys sitting at the university talking about what we needed to solve our problem that was educating our students in the use of technology. We did something that worked for us, happy enough. It worked for a lot of other people, and you know, it grew up. After some time, we realized that we needed to hire somebody to help us out. Because personally, I was putting four, five, six hours a day, every day in the week, every week in the month, for several years, and I needed a rest. The same as me, my partners. And when you start, when you need to hire people, you need to create a governance model to be able of making the money flow in the right direction. Like, you have to hire a couple of engineers. You need to pay them. Where do you get the money from, et cetera, et cetera. So we had to get incorporated. And right now, we're a mini multinational with six offices, 60 people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Another very interesting example is Adafruit, Limor, who is worth quoting for many reasons. But I think the, the way she built her company is very traditional. She was in her apartment. She was building circuits in her apartment. She had a, like a 60 or 70 square meters apartment in Manhattan, and a very old building looking very, very dangerous. And she started to hire people, and she had her bed in a corner, and people were coming in during the day, and they were building circuits, and they were selling them. And she was saving every single dollar. And one day she went and said, OK, let's buy a whole production chain, and let's rent the floor in Brooklyn or whatever. Well, it was actually Manhattan. And she, they have a gigantic company with a lot of workers, and they work fantastically well. So they had to work in building their own platforms and so on. And she has a really, really great partner that is Phil. Then the example of Maker, I already mentioned it, so I will not go into it again. Uh, but as a last turn of the history of MakerBot, they're closing her manufacturing facilities in Brooklyn, and they're going to start manufacturing in China. Because after optimizing everything, the last thing they could optimize was production. You know, they streamlined the way they designed, they streamlined the way they worked, and now the next thing they need to optimize is production to make it cheaper, because competition works like that. So now they're not even going to manufacture in the States no more. So, what has happened is that silicon has waken up. By silicon, I mean the companies that manufacture the chips. And you have heard me mentioning this multiple times in this talk. And you know, for the open source hardware community, I think you should all be worried about who's manufacturing your chips. Because there is a couple of movements that are happening right now, and it's very important to be aware of them. <clears throat> so when Arduino came in the game, and this is just us to be blamed of, of for, sorry. For example, there was a company called Microchip that was, their, their business model was to give away microchips, or chips in this case, to the students that were asking for them and selling the programming software to universities. So if a student wanted to make a project, they would ask for a sample, they would get a free sample from, from uh, Microchip, the company, and they will use the computers with the software at school. Atmel, which was a different chip manufacturer, had an entirely different approach to this. They built the compilers for their chips on open source software, which allowed them to have a compiler that was very easy to port to any operating system, and that's what they did. To contribute back to the community that gave them this compiler, they basically made the compiler available for Windows, Linux, Macintosh. <clears throat> when Arduino took over the chips made by Atmel, what happened is that we could spread all over the place. And we could make systems that were very cheap. And we gave away the software for free, because it was built on free software. So it was very easy for us to just give away the software. So we disrupted the business model from this other company that had the majority of the business in education. That provoked a reaction in all the other dis different silicon vendors when they realized that maybe working with education was key to ensure the future of their companies. Because future, if future engineers were using the chips at school, when they came out, they will influence the tools to be used at the companies. For example, Texas Instruments created the Launchpad 430. It was called 430 because the board was going to cost $4.30. That's insultingly cheap. You know, an Arduino board costs 25 euros for a reason, because you need to pay everything. Uh, we need to pay the guy that makes the chips. But in this case, it's the guy that makes the chip that goes out and makes boards because he realizes that he needs to compete against people like us that are in between parties. And anybody in this room designing open source hardware are in the same situation as Arduino is. You guys are buying chips from somebody and putting them in your devices 
and then all of a sudden, the market of development boards is going to be taken over by the silicon manufacturers. And this is, I have a couple of examples in the slide from different companies, but it's exactly the same story for all the different companies. Okay, I could go on. <clears throat> so what we're seeing next is silicon merging. I told you earlier, these different silicon companies were streamlining and just focusing on the sectors of the market they were understanding were the good ones. And instead of trying to cover the other sector of the market, they understand, oh, these guys have this user base, let's buy them. And this, that was not happening in hardware before, this was happening typically in software. You will see a software company like Google, and they will go out and buy another software company because they had a very interesting user base and they wanted to get access to that, those three, five, ten, whatever million people, right? Now this is happening in hardware. Microchip, that was a historical competitor to Atmel, went out and bought Atmel. Just like that, you know. So the company that had a completely different business philosophy than the one that was basically eating the market decided to buy them, and nobody knows what's gonna happen next. So, and this was actually a merger. It was not really a purchase, because I think both companies were really big to start with. So typically big companies buy small companies, but this was more a merger in my perception. So the question is, why, where are the viable business models for this? Well, like in other markets, small players have still some room to move because small players, they can get much easier access to end users. You know, for example, we in Arduino, uh, in the US and Genuino in Europe, this is a big, my recurrent joke, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, we work with Intel, Microsoft, Samsung. This is not very different from what happens in open source software, or free software, for that matter, where small companies, they consult larger companies because they have a better understanding of some parts of the software because they sit there and develop it. So, we're closer to users, we care about other things than bigger companies. We don't need to raise a $10 billion revenue to maintain the company afloat. We just, you know, with a couple million, we're fine. You know, and we can change faster, I'm very important in hardware, we can develop smaller batches. We can try things in an entirely different way with real users, and we can get a return of investment for those smaller batches. We don't need to like disregard them as prototypes. We can actually sell them, they can be out in the real market, and then we can make improvements. And people actually understand that we are smaller companies and they are fine with that. You know, if a big company sold you a laptop with a semi-functioning processor, you wouldn't be very happy about it. You know, if you buy a prototyping board from a small company where they tell you, you can most likely program this in JavaScript, but it's not exactly the same, you're gonna be very happy to get the opportunity to try that out. It's an entirely different mindset. Uh, yeah. So, I'm going to introduce another company that I really, really like because it's a really good example on how you can actually be competing in a market and still be friends, and um, it's Tinsy. Tinsy, it was in the beginning a one-man one -man operation. Now I think uh, they have some more people working. It's run by Paul. I'm not gonna show you a picture of Paul because he doesn't like to be in pictures, but uh, Paul is a super clever developer and he developed a core, Arduino-compatible core for a different kind of processor. And he realized very early on that he didn't want to have to develop or to maintain a whole development environment for his own system. I mentioned Launchpad earlier from Texas Instruments. They, they did fork the Arduino IDE, and they made something, something called Energia. Well, I don't know exactly if the, they, they had the same design philosophy, but we don't enter into that. But the truth of the matter is that they designed this thing that looks the same as we did. Uh, and uh, Tinsy decided to have a different operation mode. They decided to contribute to our code base. They say, if you let my chips to be running in your system, I will devote this many hours per month in helping out maintaining your software. Since we're a small company, we can totally quantify that and we can make it happen. <clears throat> but then I was having a conversation with uh, Paul the other day at Maker Faire uh, Bay Area. I was discussing about all the silicon mergers and about the silicon vendors making their own prototyping platforms. And he basically said what he says there. If silicon vendors sell boards without their own chips, how will Tinsy compete? You know, he's using some ARM processors, ARM7 processors and stuff like this. 
if the company making the chips makes its own development boards that are compatible with his own board, how is he supposed to sell his boards? If the company making the chips are making the chips, they can cut out that margin and can sell, they will always be cheaper than himself. So he has no competition. So suddenly, these companies are disrupting the business for the smaller players. And that's really, really worrisome. So this is one of the biggest threats right now to open source hardware, that large silicon vendors are completely destroying the margins for people that are making small products. If you're making a big product, like you guys making a camera, it's an entirely different story. You, you are the apple of this business. You make something that is in the high end, but if you, make, you try to make something that is a lot more democratic, that try to reach everybody because it's very small and so on, you have, you're gonna have a really hard time. So, uh, so at the edge of finishing my talk, I am one minute over. I, I want to uh, just close with another reflection. And uh, it's about discussing about Microbit. And this is yet another model. As you know, Microbit is a big initiative launched by the UK government. Oh, actually by the BBC, but the BBC is financed by the UK government and taxpayers in the UK to make a prototyping board that should reach every kid at every school and so on and so forth. But they wanted to spend as little money as possible so they appealed to the corporate social responsibility departments from different companies and they developed things for them. For example, Microsoft or Samsung developed compilers to run the code for these boards. So this is a different way how these players can be involved. But what is the problem in this model? The problem in this model is that there's no room for small players. We go back to the thing I said in the previous slide. You have to be a big player like the BBC to put together this whole operation where you get the big companies to discuss with, you know. Uh, these other guys making the boards and so on and so forth to make it reach everybody. So what we see is that it's becoming more and more complicated to start with very niche, small projects. So the question is, uh, open source hardware is working, isn't it? So I think uh, it's working, but it's working at a different level. It doesn't mean, I mean, I just gave you a picture of things that I think are worrisome. It doesn't mean that there is no room for, for discussion and improvement. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, are there any questions from the audience for David? All right, um, quiet start. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, it's, um, okay, here we go. I don't know if you are aware of 21 Incorporated and their uh, micro mining equipments like the, the structure, uh, very small miniature uh, integrated circuits and use it for mining operations. Do you believe that one of the future of using the capacity in uh, independent designs could be to go for high performance equipment which would need additional capacity even if there is no human use for it. Maybe there is use for making money or making mining equipments and maybe there is a new emerging niche for um, uh, efforts to make open source hardware. Well, uh, I wasn't aware of this particular company but I do believe that that's, that's one of the lines of work, obviously. If you look at why CERN contributed to the creation of the open source hardware license, one of the main reasons was that they wanted to be able of having their designs not made by, for example, National Instruments, but made by whatever studio in France, and then get the design and give it to a different company to make it and improve it and so on. They want to be the owners of the IP of this design. So I think that for very specific situations like this one, open source offers a lot of advantages because the user will stop being tied up to a single company to make things. And that will also force these companies to give a lot better service. And in, in conversations at CERN, at an open hardware conversation like this one, with the scientists and with people from National Instruments, people from National Instruments actually de declared that they felt comfortable with this model. Um, even though they knew they were not making as much money. 
but it also meant that they could have a lot of these more agile companies to be involved in the process that gives a lot more eyes to review. So that, that's also a very interesting scenario. I think it works for this. It works, again, for the people making expensive cameras. Uh, I'm just trying to get the camera for free. <laughs> and, uh, but I think, I think for, for highly specialized equipment, uh, I think it's, it's definitely a, a room for it. You know, because as long as there is not a big demand in the market, nobody's going to be bothering and cloning you, you know, because, because they are not going to have a big outreach. It makes no sense. What we see is that when you make something that is very cheap and easy to reproduce, it's cloned massively. As soon as there is a slightly higher technological challenge in the manufacturing process, like radiation, uh, FCC rules, or whatever, whatever, uh, clones, uh, they stop there. You know, they have a harder time. Yeah, thanks for the interesting um, comments. Um, you mentioned hardware licenses. Do you think like we are already there? What's needed to protect uh, open source hardware from a regulation side? Or because, I mean, it's an old topic, but do you think it's already finished or do we further development to protect IP in the open source hardware? You mean the license? Yeah. I mean, the license will ones. not be, in my opinion, and this is not just my opinion, actually, this comes from CERN's lawyers. <laughs> uh, the license won't really be valid until it wins a court case. Until it's, it sets a legal precedent, the license is only a legal paper that we use among ourselves to discuss. Um, I, I was at a very interesting talk by a San Francisco lawyer that is specialized in open source and free software licensing that's been in a lot of cases and says that the big problem is that uh, it's like if you want to get patents, you need money to get the patents. Not just one patent, but a bunch of patents to protect your actual idea, right? If you don't want to get patents and you go to, with licenses, either for the greater good or just because you don't have the money, doesn't matter. Uh, from a legal standpoint, you end up in the same scenario. You are the one that has to also enact your right in this case. So if somebody copies you, you have to bring this other person to court. And you have to pay the legal fees until you win the case. And that might take a long, long time. So uh, basically, in open source software, there's already a precedent. There's already precedence on this. On uh, Creative Commons, there's also precedence uh, people winning cases in court because they were using Creative Commons uh, licensed music, for example, in a bar, and, and they were asked to pay the music task, uh, tax in Spain, and they won the case because they said, no, we only use uh, Creative Commons music, we don't have to pay any tax on that regard, and they won the case. It was proof, uh, proven and they won the case. Uh, but in open source hardware, we haven't seen a court case yet. So until we see that, uh, our license hasn't really been, it's not bulletproof. It's a really good contract, I have to say. It's been looked through by a lot of good lawyers, and they have good opinions about it, and so on. But it's not bulletproof. It hasn't been you know, put through a court case. So please, somebody, sue somebody, <laughs> and let's try it out. <laughs> uh, hi. Thanks a lot for your uh, kind talk. I really was following it with a lot of interest. In one of your last slides, uh, you mentioned BBC's Microbit, uh, Microbit, and I personally have never heard of it. So could you kind of like give some in-depth knowledge to it and maybe some vision? What are the risks or advantages to it that are coming up? Maybe like a prognosis from your side? Well, uh, it's hard to say. What happens with Microbit is that Microbit I'm going to let you there. You see, it says there, leaving aside the IP conflict, OK, with Microbit. There is a IP conflict. I cannot mention that. But uh, you can research about it. I'm sure you will find this thing uh, of a really small company being kind of a little bit ripped off. Um, uh, but Microbit has been a governmental supported initiative through the BBC. Uh, has really the potential of transforming education in the UK, in my opinion. Uh, on the other hand, I haven't really spoken about my personal research. I'm researching about tools versus uh, kits versus platforms. That's my doctoral thesis, forthcoming March next year. You're all invited, by the way. Uh, 
I think Microbit is just a tool. It's not a platform. To be a platform, it's lacking a lot of community behind it. And what they're trying is to artificially create this community. The thing is that since it's governmentally supported, it might succeed. And then they're trying to build a foundation, then that will carry on this thing on. So they're trying to give them this uh, legal framework and orga organizational uh, apparatus to be able of moving on. But you have a whole government supporting it. So it's, if you want to do that in Austria or in Sweden for that matter, uh, you will need really a lot of cash to make it happen. You know? Because basically they're making over a million boards at the first run. And that is a lot of boards. Arduino reached one million boards after seven years or something like this. So you get the picture, you know. They're trying to, to accelerate the pace of seven years in one year and just for one single age group. So the outreach is fantastic. Uh, but the probability of failure is also very high. You know, when you take a risk like that one, the probability of failure can be a disaster as well. It can be a disaster just for them, it can be a disaster for the whole ecosystem. That's also very risky. Yeah, so I keep my fingers crossed that microbit will work, actually. <laughs> okay. uh, thank you very much, David. Um, I think what was definitely, what could definitely be heard in your talk as well is that there are a lot of legal questions involved in the issue of open hardware and open source software. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's very interesting, and that's also um, also the, the the issue of open um, source, op open hardware licensing was mentioned, mm -hmm. which is actually going to be part of the, our next talk, um, addressed by Michael Weinberg. So, if there aren't any further questions from the audience, um, I would like to thank you very, very much for your yep. talk. Thank you. Um,